on. Meeting started. You can call us to order anytime. All right. I'd like to, oh, well, the first thing we have is applicant interviews, and then you would call us to okay. order. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, I get, yeah, we're going to have our applicant interview with Christopher Weaver here first. So, come on up. Speak to the mic, I presume? Yeah. All right. So we got uh, five questions, is it? Yep. And four are kind of pre preset, and the fifth is other questions from the committee. So you guys can divvy those up amongst yourselves. Sure. I'll I'll kick it off. Um, sure. I'm, I'm Trent. Um, uh, please tell us why you're interested in serving on the Natural Resource Committee. Um, well, I've been a resident of Oregon City now for about uh, five years. Um, in that time, I've pursued a career in landscape architecture. Um, and I'd like to think it's, it's partly because I was inspired by just what I've found here in this community. Um, you know, there's so much natural and geological diversity. It's just very inspiring. And I just really wanted to... Uh, you know, really contribute more um, just as a citizen um, in addition to just in a professional capacity. Cool. Well, oh, thank you for that. Yep. What's your background in natural resources? My background in natural resources, well, um, it's very recent. <laughs> uh, I uh, have a master's in landscape architecture. Um, and I've been a landscape designer with the firm Greenworks for about four months now. Uh, my career is very nascent, but very much like to hit the ground running. Um, before that, uh, I have some background um, just in GIS mm -hmm. and uh, college coursework related to the matter. Uh, in addition to that, just, you know, in a grassroots capacity, I've always participated in some way, shape, or form um, in citizen science or just volunteerism. Uh, I volunteer for four years with Willamette River Keepers, um, doing water quality testing uh, on the Pudding River. Uh, that was before I discovered landscape architecture. It was just, um, I knew it was in the vein of my interest. So I was lucky to have found uh, more concentrated route. Have you previously served on an appointed advisor and an appointed advisory committee or board? No. Plainly no. <laughs> <laughs> you go by Chris or Christopher? Chris is good. Okay. okay. Are there specific projects you feel, that you feel the Natural Resource Committee should pursue? And uh, would you uh, would you answer change if there were budget? And would you, excuse me, um, would you answer change if there were budget constraints? And I guess the, uh, uh, I'm not sure the written question here, but uh, what, what would, would, would your actual position change if there were budget constraints? Um, well, um, I should first just come clean and say that I'm not actually aware of what projects are currently on the horizon, so it's kind of hard to comment on whether I would actually kind of constrain my own views on the matter. Um, but generally, uh, as far as you know, prospects to be addressed by the committee, uh, I would say uh, ecological improvements just in the spaces that we have uh, that don't involve property acquisitions of any kind. Um, I think that there's a lot that we could do to kind of strengthen the natural habitat just in our parks and open spaces. Um, things that have already actually kind of been launched in, in places like uh, Kanima, where we've uh, removed some of the Climax dug for forest and actually kind of reseeded for uh, Upland Prairie. I'd like to see more of that kind of in a continuation all the way down the river so that we can actually have a contiguous habitat, that sort of thing. And uh, if the funding wasn't an issue, what would you do? <laughs> <laughs> the funding is always an issue. But... <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, 
Um, well, hard to say. I've never actually been faced with a dilemma. Um, I would probably defer to my superiors in that matter mm. and uh, look for leadership. I guess, yeah, so we're here kind of on the, the other questions that might come up. Uh, my, my one question is, um, what in your past experience in landscape architecture, volunteering, anything like that, um, an example of something you've done that would really apply to a committee or like something that the committee might address or endorse, or I mean, just something that you can relate, I guess, that really pops in your mind. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, <clears throat> professionally, I'm usually kind of on the other side of things, or at least I'm poised to be on the other side of things. Um, I work mostly in production and planning. I don't deal directly um, with advisory committees in the public, but I'd like to really gain uh, more of an understanding just of the perspective, because I know that I am going to be, you know, the consulting professional in the future, and I just want to be able to come at it from all sides. Uh, just, uh, I just noticed we, uh, we had the honor of our parks maintenance person, uh, person in charge of park maintenance coming in. We've got a lot of, and you, and you mentioned Kanima, we've got a lot of natural uh, areas in our parks. Some of them are just parts of the park and others, it's basically mostly a natural area. Have you had a chance to visit the, I'll uh, say city owned natural resources that we do have? Um. Well, uh, Null Creek Canyon, I would say, would be one. Mm -hmm. um, as best as I could, uh, access is a bit of an issue, but it's, it's, it's always just been um, a point of curiosity for me. Uh, that and the trail systems going throughout the town and uh, connecting over into Westland. Tried to really explore as much as I can. Yeah. Great. Anybody else, anything else? Is there a particular area of natural resources that interests you the most? Um, I would say probably resilience planning um, for climate change. Um, I'm expecting within my lifetime that we're going to see some major shifts as to what types of uh, communities can actually be supported here in the Willamette Valley. Um, so just looking ahead and thinking, um, you know, how can we plan for that accordingly? How can we actually design these communities to stand in the face of that and actually thrive? We have a comprehensive plan update process that's gonna start for the next two years. So we'll be discussing that very thing as part of all of those goals. And so that's great. Excellent. Thank you. Mm. Any other? Yeah. All right. Anybody else have any questions? Okay. Yeah. Well, we appreciate your time tonight, Chris. Um, great great talking with you. Yeah. All right. So the Thank way you all very much. it will work is the Natural Resources Committee will provide a recommendation um, to the mayor, and the mayor alone will make an appointment, and he may want to talk to you individually as well. So we'll sort out a time and for him to do that if if he wants to do that. Otherwise, Excellent. you might just take whatever recommendation comes forward from the NRC. Yep. Great. Oh, great. Yeah, I really appreciate it, guys. Yeah, appreciate no, your good, time. Good time. Right. Yep. Yeah, Thanks for coming. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Chris. All right. All right. I'd like to call to order the Natural Resource Committee on November 13th, 2019. <laughs> Get a euro ahead of my <laughs> And there's a staff request to um, put item 4B before item 4A. Okay, that works. Problem Anything with that. else you care to do? Okay. Oh, yeah, we can do that. Okay, great. You go. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> and. I don't have any public comment cards for items not on the agenda. So we can move on to old business as you, when you're Okay, ready. sorry, so yeah, pub, no uh, public comments, uh, old business. Um, 
start going off with the so which one i thought you said you wanted to move something yeah so the first thing we'd like to discuss is because lars here is well i have river green oh, okay yeah, yeah yeah so we'd like to yeah yeah and i've got a presentation that will key up here all right thank you very much uh lord terway community development director Sorry. city good to see you <laughs> um I am here just to chat a little bit about some proposed code amendments. I know you talked about them a little bit, but we didn't give you a lot of context before about the history of Lamp River Greenway. And so we are here to do that tonight. There's a draft of the code amendments circling around um, as well. These amendments have been through planning commission at the city commission level. They're a part of our bigger package of code amendments. Um, as you recall, we rewrote lots of sections of our code um, that became effective on August 2nd. And this is that follow-up. So as a part of the follow-up, we're doing any cleanup amendments, but also we took a look at the Lambert Greenway and realized there's some places where we can add a lot of clarity to our code where we don't have it. And so that's why we're looking at these amendments tonight. Uh, the timeline for these code amendments moving forward is that um, we'll be asking for city commission approval on December 4th. So we're coming up close uh, to the time when we're asking for adoption. You, the, city, the NRC doesn't have to make a recommendation. You can make a recommendation, um, but your feedback is certainly um, much appreciated. Uh, we want to make sure that when we do these code amendments, we get it right because uh, who knows when we will amend them again. Uh, a lot of our Willamette River Greenway code came from some standard code that was adopted a long time ago. So we are doing, um, think of surgical editing and not rewriting the whole code, just the real bad parts. Um, okay, so there's a statewide planning goal 15, Willamette River Greenway, and its goal is to protect, conserve, enhance, and maintain the natural, scenic, historical, agricultural, economic, and recreational qualities of lands along the Willamette River as the Willamette River Greenway. It's a really long sentence, and that's a lot of stuff in a sentence, um, to protect all of those things. So um, from my understanding, this, the evolution of this goal is sort of a pushback to when you saw a lot of industrialization next to the river and people lost access and things like that as well. Um, <laughs> Willamette, uh, Willamette Falls is sort of a, an example of that, a lot of downtown Portland too. And so we want to make sure that we protect um, both from the river looking up, but then also looking towards the river as well. Uh, the state law requires that we review development within 150 feet of the river, but you'll see um, through this presentation that we actually do a lot more than that. We're not proposing to amend the boundaries of the overlay district, just some of the language. So the map is going to stay as is. You can see that it covers Kanema, um, and then also it covers a lot of our um, land close to the river, a lot of our park lands as well. Clackamas River, when their master plan happened, they went through a type three review for this to look at the impacts of those proposed restrooms and docks and things and its impact on the river. <clears throat> So we comply with state law or the state goal through the adoption of Chapter 1748, the Willamette River Greenway in our code. It sets out a full process and it's similar to natural resources overlay district as well, which you're much familiar with. So basically it has levels of review. Some review is a type three, um, which is reviewed by the Planning Commission, and some is a type two. So the ones that are type three that require a public hearing and Planning Commission review are those within the compatibility boundary, which is that 150 feet. So basically, um, state law says we need to regulate the land within 150 feet. So we said if you're within 150 feet, that requires Planning Commission review. Um, so it talks about to that the greatest extent possible development or change or intensification of use provides the maximum possible landscaped area, open space, vegetation between the activity and the river. So 
Can we create a space or a buffer? Or can we move whatever disturbance is proposed back away from the river? And then the next thing that we look at is, is there public access that needs to happen to the greatest degree possible? Necessary public access is provided and provided to and along the Willamette River by appropriate legal means. There's some legal stuff that happens with us trying to get exactions for people to get to someone's property. So in order for the public to walk on someone's property to the river, it's a little bit, there's a lot of layers there. But the general idea between the overlay district is that development is pushed back from the river. It's maybe um, uh, not as tall, not as close. It's minimized at some point. Um, and then if you wanna do anything else within the overlay district, it's uh, that's more than 150 feet from the river. That is reviewed as a staff level. There's still a public comment period and opportunity for people to talk about these criteria, but um, it is, there's no public hearing. Both of those decisions can be appealed to the city commission as well. Um, let me tell you a little bit more about the requirements. And again, here's a picture of uh, the park, which did go through review. So again, access is a big thing. Um, if you look at the criteria in the Willamette River Greenway, they're not exactly clear and objective. They're a little bit discretionary. Like when is adequate public access? What meets that standard? And how do we have the ability to get that from people? Um, protection and safety, so it talks about safety of public and private property and from vandalism and trespassing to the maximum extent possible. Very discretionary there. So again, you're seeing that when I get to the code amendments, we're doing surgical amendments. For most of this is this basic code that was adopted a long time ago, and it's, for the most part, unchanging. And then the more important part is the vegetative fringe, so we wanna make sure that we maintain some vegetation next to the water. We know that we also have a natural resource overlay district that also applies, and it may, requires a vegetated corridor, which is also a vegetative fringe next to the water. So you're kind of seeing these two um, requirements overlapping um, for the same purpose as well. Directing development away from the river, we talked about that. So rather than putting a building, if you have a piece of property that's on the water, can you put the building further away from the water rather than really close to the water? Or could you orient it in a specific way that is helpful to minimize its impact so that the public, say, driving by on the street side on one side couldn't see past your building or next to your building to see towards the water? And then the greenway setback, which is similar to the vegetative fringe as well. So try and stay away from the river. Um, there's a couple of proposed code, main, code changes. There's three major things. One is we're adding to the list of exemptions in the Lamb River Greenway. There are minor things that um, have no need for a Lamb River Greenway review. So for example, wall signs. Um, or if you're not building within the compatibility boundary and you're just doing exterior changes, so if you're putting up an awning or adding a door or a window, if you're not within 150 feet of the river and you're adding a door or window, seems like it should not apply because you're really not gonna change the impact from the river, it's too far away. And then for commercial, multifamily, industrial, any changes to landscaping or parking that are more than 100 feet, feet away from the ordinary low, those are exempt because again, you're either planting plants or changing plants, and then you're just changing the orientation of parking lots within a, a parking stalls within a parking lot. It's really not gonna make any visual difference uh, for the sake of the river. And then any subject, any review that's subject to a type one site plan, again, those are minor things that are non-discretionary. You can add a window, you can add a door, you can um, add an awning or something like that. Um, and so since those, if those are entirely outside the compatibility boundary, which is that 150 feet, then they ought not to apply to the Greenway. The next is single family and two family residential. So we want to make clear that any changes to landscaping or a driveway or 
any exterior modifications or accessory buildings or something like that really isn't going to impact. If you're um, up in Kanema up the hill, if you build a driveway, that's really not going to make a di big difference from the river. Not going to be able to see it well from the river. And you're not blocking any views or anything like that. Um, so those are the big, that's the biggest part of these code amendments is we realize that our code doesn't have all these exemptions for things that it should have. Um, then the next one is uh, there was some conflicting language about how to process these things. It had a bit of a process built in and then it referenced our general 1750, which is our administrative procedures code. And so it did both things, and both things weren't the same thing. So we are just ad referencing our administrative procedures code. And then the other big thing is that there was a standard in here that did not allow residential structures greater than 35 feet. And you could do any other structure greater than 35 feet. It was silent on mixed use because I'm sure when it was created, that wasn't a big thing that was being developed at the time, but it seemed rather arbitrary. We believe that this may have been created back when the historic districts were coming online, or right before the historic districts were coming online, and since, since then we now have protections um, for Kanema through our historic overlay district. So the building height and massing is really, is reviewed through the historic district and doesn't really need to be reviewed through the Lambert Greenway. Also, we identify need for housing and for types of housing. Um, so if you have multifamily and some of these zoning designations, you may want to be 35 feet or taller. And so we didn't want to put this arbitrary cap on multifamily for no particular reason. We have a comprehensive plan, and um, as you all know, it mentions the River Greenway, and um, it talks about preservation of views, protection of fish and wildlife, which happens through these vegetative corridors and these setbacks that we impose through both Enrod, but also the Willamette River Greenway as well. Um, that's it. That was sort of a lot in a short amount of time, but really the code amendments. So the purpose of the Greenway is to protect the river and to protect ourselves from ourselves in the future so that we still can engage with the river, both when we're in the river looking up or up looking down at the river as well. And so it's primarily looking at how do we maintain access, vegetation, and um, move things away from blocking the river. The code amendments themselves are this list of things we're exempting, as well as removing the prohibition on residential structures greater than 35 feet in height, which is missing from that slide, and then also just an administrative cleanup. Do you guys have any questions or comments on this? Yes. We got, I've got one. The one stream that we have going into the Willamette River that is an anatomous fish bearing stream is Abernathy Creek. Uh -huh. And I know that the uh, ODOT has sought, I think, construction easements and so forth to go on onto the, uh, onto the uh, uh, I-5 and that, uh, that culvert is right adjacent uh, to that uh, particular location. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I don't know what might be happening in terms of their work in that covert space, but and it's, not, it's not tied to the code really, but, uh, or maybe it is, but to what degree will Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife be uh, looking at uh, that I-5 and, uh, bridge improvement with respect to uh, any impacts that they are gonna have on the covert itself? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I think there's outstanding questions if they want to change that culvert a little bit um, through work with Wes as well. Um, that will need lots of review. The freeway project or expansion of I-5 uh, will need a whole list of reviews from the planning department. So you'll see it, you'll probably end up hearing, you'll probably get a presentation for it also because it's, 
uh, will likely be a type three natural resource overlay district. Um, so we will go through all of our notification channels. Um, I don't, we have a provision in the natural resources overlay district that you have to contact other applicable agencies. I assume ODOT will contact other applicable agencies because they're doing some in water work. So we'll need a joint permit application through the core and other things. Um, so yes, they, they should be getting permits through them as well or looping them in through that process. Did I answer your question? I think, I think so. I, it's just, uh -oh. uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's something, we, it's something we know is coming forward, and of course it is in the overlay district, and I just uh, was wondering basically where, whether we'll be involved in the process. I, the problem is that I don't have all of the details yet. We worked yeah. on it conceptually, and so the plans weren't at the level of specificity that we needed to be at to give them a lot of guidance. But I, from what I know, I would be highly surprised if it didn't come before you. Yeah. And before the Planning Commission also. All right. Well, thank you very much. Well, yes, if you, you have any, do you have any comments more to add to the City Commission or you want us to con convey anything? Okay. I don't have anything, no. Thumbs up, power. Cool, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. That was four B. Yep, so next is the staff. The next one is 4A, which is a, uh, oh, I see, okay. We discussed this at the last meeting, but, um, and we had some initial input on habitat and the Beaver Creek Road concept plan. We wanted to come back and uh, revisit that and clarify a few other things. So Christina Robertson Gardner is here to present. Thank you, Thank you. Pete. As you recall, uh, when I made the presentation in October, just to give a overview, the Planning Commission is going through hearings for the Beaver Creek Road concept plan zoning and code amendments. The concept plan was adopted in 2008, uh, readopted in 2016, and now uh, the planning staff's job and planning commission is to take a 60 page narrative document and turn it into code and rezone properties that are inside the city limits. Um, but right now hold county zoning because this plan has not been implemented. Uh, and as we move through the process, we've been looking at the adopted plan and our existing city uh, codes and what needs to be amended specifically for this area. And one item that I brought up at the October meeting was overlaying our natural resource overlay district boundaries, our geologic hazard boundaries, looking at our 1741 tree protection code. Uh, as it relates to upland habitat areas that were identified in the plan, and those are identified in those orange areas um, in the adopted plan. And actually, the next slide uh, is this map of kind of overlaying it, and I identified four areas, uh, areas one, two, three, and four, where I saw just a little, I saw either a little bit of mismatch or a fair amount of mismatch. Uh, and so when I made the presentation in October, I was relaying the information that the Planning Commission felt that the um, existing overlay codes, uh, overlay zones, uh, substantially implemented the concept of upland habitat and the difference uh, on balance was okay because they're balancing economic development uh, concerns as well. What I heard from the Natural Resource Committee in October that you wanted to see a little bit more code for these upland habitat areas. And as we move forward on the process, I realized the best way to kind of bring your comments in is I can submit them to the Planning Commission and then um, get their direction to see what additional code may be. So my goal tonight uh, is I actually wrote um, a some draft memo that you'll see uh, on your desk and on the dais, and generally it is trying to recap what I just mentioned, what I heard from the October meeting, which is you feel that um, 
additional code should be written uh, to address uh, upland habitat areas adjacent to natural resource and water features. Excuse me, uh, amendment to water, excuse me abutting uh, protected water features. We don't have to write code this evening, so don't worry, I'm not putting you on the spot. Uh, so, <laughs> which I think everyone's happy about. Uh, but so uh, what this is an introductory memo that just uh, kind of states your int intent and your wish and that you would like to work with staff. Um, I, I added the two maps I just showed on the PowerPoint. But what I, I'd like from this evening is if there's additional specific comments you want to add to this memo, I can add to the memo as well if there's any, you want to talk about any of the specific of the four areas and we can bring up Google Maps again and if you want to keep it vague, that's fine. If you want to add specific comments, I can do that. And then this memo I plan to submit into the record at the Monday Planning Commission meeting and try to schedule a future time to talk about it and then work with Pete and looking kind of what if upland habitat protection is important, uh, how best do we put that in the code? So I'm kind of open up for a, a general conversation and I can type as we talk. I recall from the previous meeting, Nancy uh, brought in specifically, I think the, the two pieces that were uh, on the right that actually, uh, I think sort of abutted the, the water, the, mm -hmm. the uh, yeah. Thimble Creek watershed yeah. area. Uh, one thing I note is that um, the, the one on the left uh, further uh, on the bottom there, um, actually, it seems to surround a, a stream segment. I, I presume it's not a perennial stream, but a stream segment that's uh, actually that is not culverted. So, which number? Uh, that would be three. Three. Yeah. Three. Uh, no, or two. 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 You're looking at two. This piece I here. I think you're looking at two. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the one. So two okay. looks like. Yes, that part is open, and then it goes into a culvert farther south. Right. Yeah. Uh, and I think that, that even though we're talking about upland uh, uh, overlays, I, I think it adds to the significance of, of that, given you have a, a stream that is actually going through it, and it's not culverted. Right, in that area, it does have, um, doesn't have the benefit of the geologic hazard overlay, which areas three and four do. Um, that really is just the um, it, the, nat the natural resource overlay of the stream in any identified wetland in that little area. Actually, Pete, would you mind opening up Google Maps really quickly for that area? And I apologize. Yeah, sure. If I remember that, that if I can remember the, the area one and two, uh, I think two I was had a about lot two. more diverse. I was talking about yeah, two. Yeah. Of the two between one and two, two had a lot more diverse um, tree canopy. Than one, but we can. I can't remember. We can to kind of zoom in and we do a 3D view. Was that? I go down to the bottom right. I don't want to. Mm -hmm. I want to. And then maybe do 3D. Yeah. Cool. So if you're looking, <laughs> uh, four is probably farther down, right? Where pretty close to where Pete's, um, I'll do this. We're probably, this is about area four. Mm -hmm. yep. So these were kind of swinging along right here. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. This is area three, so a little bit, look, you know, the geologic hazards kind of was like about right, right. here. So mm -hmm. this area this was, looks like it was out right? of the geologic hazard protection. Yeah, was this was what yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, right. Doug was talking yeah. about. This is area two, and then area yeah. one is this area right here. That is area one. So I'm gonna go back here just to, so area one, two, three, and four. Yeah. Okay. I can go back. Um, you wanna go back to the... So I mean, I, th I think that adds the significance of that uh, particular one, the number two, uh, having that uh, stream there. How long is how long a section of stream is it? Uh, it, show, it shows on the map actually. It, covert, it, covert, it looks like it's culverted. Culverted. Uh, oh, sorry. On on the on the north and south sides of that area, but not within the area itself. If I was looking uh, okay. at that uh, 
uh, one map correctly, uh -huh. I guess it's the uh, oh. heading through here. Uh, yeah. you, you can see it there, kind of. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh. well, so I think it adds to the significance of that piece. Mm -hmm. Is that piece protected because the stream is in it? Or well, it's part it, I mean, it has some protection, right. but it doesn't go out to that full canopy area. Okay. So if you look at the, um, going back to the map, um, oops, you'll see, um, let's see if I can zoom in. Hour of zoom. <laughs> we, uh, this one. So uh, if you'll see, uh, there is some, so this shows a little bit of a wetlands. And then once again, I don't think this is actually existing. I think this has been culverted. Yeah. Um, but the tree area kind of comes down along here. So it's not all of it. So if development came in, all we would do be able to protect is within what, basically within the, the pink. Right. And then once again here, we could check the pink, but the tree canopy goes a little bit lower kind of around here. So if you, we, uh, if you have specific comments, I can take them. I'm here a little bit from two. If you don't have any additional comments, you just want to keep your comments vague. Basically, anything you think will be helpful to the Planning Commission tonight, I can incorporate into this memo. I think it'd be good to know the area especially for one and two of those little forested areas, if mm -hmm. they could get a, you know, like how much area is actually covered by that forest. But again, we need to protect the stream, but so two may be more valuable. One looks pretty small, but again, mm -hmm. without knowing how mm -hmm. big those are, it's, we don't really know. Okay. But I still think three and four are really important to protect because they are contiguous with a much bigger forested mm -hmm. area than just what they're looking at protecting. What did we estimate number two was? It was a couple of acres, we thought. Yeah. Outside of the top of the bank, potentially, or the entire contiguous canopy. Um, uh, we did a measurement about three weeks ago, so I'm a little fuzzy on that. Right. But I, um, just using OSC web map, and it, I think it was close to about two acres, just drawing a circle okay. around it. Mm -hmm. Would that be right? right? I think so, yeah. yeah. Um, so what I'm hearing uh, is uh, areas three and four are the most important to protect as they're contiguous to large habitat areas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Area two is important um, as it uh, you have a stream intersecting it. And so adding, adding additional canopy and, and, uh, and habitat area to that buffer is important. And then looking, um, providing looking into more information about area one, just to see what really is is left outside of that of that uh, area, mm -hmm. and look in on balance how can additional code be written to protect knowing those right those three comments. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then when is uh, City Commission talking about this? We don't know yet. We so don't know. The next steps. Uh, we kind of every two weeks, Planning Commission takes topics. Uh, November 25th is all about transportation, so probably I can talk about on the 25th of November, which means we're probably in early December. And the reason why I think it'd be helpful to get this uh, memo in is then it can kind of get staff kind of direction from the Planning Commission to start doing some research, and then I can share back draft code, and hopefully maybe we can have draft code available for the December NRC meeting. Be great. Sure. Um, most likely this will be, we won't have a formal planning commission recommendation until the new year and then the city commission will be looking uh, at the code amendment sometime after that. So uh, not super fast, but also not super slow. We're on a bit of a clip, but, but you know, it's a legislative process, so there's not a, a time constraint on us if we need to slow down and do extra analysis. Okay. For me, real quick, just to catch up, this will... Are all four of these re areas outside of the geologic and the natural? So the source? geologic hazard overlay is what you see in orange. Okay. Orange and red. Okay. The pink uh, kind of um, 
amoebas, I guess is, a, yep. uh, okay, is the uh, natural resource overlay district. So when you, the idea is to kind of take the natural resource overlay district and the geologic hazards and kind of see where there's, uh, there's not overlap. And so nice. that's okay. where I identified those I gotcha. three areas. Yep. All right. Yep. So what I'll do is I'll finish up writing these code of mem. I mean this this memo. I'll send it uh, to Pete kind of before Monday. So if you see anything that um, is a wrong sentence or you know I ch I chose to use the wrong word, let Pete know and I'll I'll make the amendment before Monday. And then this presentation, can we make this available somewhere? This right. presentation. Yeah. Is it on the Planning Commission? Uh, oh, a link to it. I can yeah. provide a link to it on the Code Amendments website right now. And then I uh, can provide a link to this PowerPoint, as well as the, 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 the draft, the memo that I'll send. Oh, yeah. OK. <laughs> That is all I have, and thank you very much for your direction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll just work on it right now. <laughs> all right. new business. Okay. So next item on the agenda is um, discussion, preliminary discussion about uh, the review process for tree removal on city-owned land. Um, and there's a lot of attachments. Uh, these are the same uh, exhibits that were provided to the city commission um, in response to the swimming pool uh, tree removal. Um, and the, we also have John Waverly here from the parks. He's our parks maintenance superintendent. Um, talk about their, uh, considerations for what they do when they're, when they're managing trees. Um, so I'm going to go through this brief presentation. We can circle back and talk about things. Um, this is very preliminary. Um, I have some questions at the end that I just want to bounce off you, and I'm going to be taking notes. I'm primarily here to listen and try to clarify things. Um, and eventually, I think what we're going to be doing is coming together to develop um, some new policies and codes with respect to tree removal on city-owned properties. Um, and we'll probably be talking about this with several other committees as well, including PRAC and the Planning Commission and the City Commission. Um, and so you're the first committee to discuss this, I believe, <laughs> um, as far as this, this portion of the review. Um, so I'll get started. Thanks. And we do have some comments. Um, so I'll leave it up to the chair when you would like to, to hear comments. I can give my presentation or, or however um, I handle it. I don't have a mm. uh, I Let's hear the presentation. Uh, let's go, yeah. yeah, let's hear the presentation first. Let me just check okay. that afterwards. All right. And John, if you want to take a seat anytime, that's fine. So, um, so in your packet, there's a memorandum prepared by Tony Conkle, city manager. Um, and one of one of those documents is a summary and findings about the tr removal at the swimming pool and how that leads into a, a discussion of process improvements. And there are kind of six bullet points that Tony discussed in that summary um, as far as how we can improve the process for review. I'm going to talk about the current process as well, but just want to refer back to this slide if we need to. 
first item was to beginning with the heritage tree code as a, as a kind of a basis in terms of tree size and type, um, um, would that serve as an appropriate means to trigger additional review um, for further analysis of alternative methods to retain healthy trees? Um, and second item was we would be reviewing, we've already done this to a certain extent in the code as far as allowing the city engineer to make modifications to public improvement standards, but we'd be reviewing the public works sidewalk standards in particular, which is a set of specifications and standard drawings that are engineering documents uh, to determine which alternative construction types and sidewalk rerouting types could be, would be acceptable to achieve this. I uh, also want to talk about the de determining when and how a public notification process would be triggered for this uh, based on this new analysis. Um, and already the uh, various departmental staff have been updated on the current code requirements, but we'd also be uh, talking to these departments if we develop new policy and having their input on this um, to reflect current code. Um, and then we'll have uh, within the departments an internal review process um, to make sure that everybody is following the correct procedures. And then um, we anticipate that there will be a lot more uh, input from not just parks department staff but public works because we have street crews who are out there, um, we have uh, stormwater maintenance crews and uh, water uh, facility crews that are out there um, dealing with trees occasionally for maintenance issues. Currently, um, we have a review process for um, removal of trees on uh, non-residential property, so that's gonna be triggered if you have commercial property, mixed-use property, multifamily property, and public city-owned land property. Those are properties where the trees are growing on real estate that's not in the right-of-way. So we have a separate process for street tree removal in the public right-of-way, and we're not talking about that. Um, it'll probably come into play at some point too, but right now we're talking about the on-site process that we have. Um, and we require what is called a type one minor site plan and design review permit um, for landscaping changes. And sometimes those landscaping changes involve removal of trees from a um, formerly landscaped area like a parking lot or formerly landscaped area around a building, those kinds of things which are regulated. And then we're dealing with, sometimes we just tree removal on properties that don't have as formal landscaping. And so depending on which one you are, we have a addendum that goes with that plan. The one that I'm showing here is our standard, our addendum 4B tree removal. And what it covers is where's the property, who's the owner. It has to have either a landscape architect prepare the plan or a certified arborist come up with a plan for removal and mitigation. Um, in this case, it's based on clear and objective criteria in the code and a mitigation table. Um, and uh, there is no public notice associated with this sort of permit right now. And, uh, and so just so we can refer to the Heritage Tree Code, which was just updated, um, this is the table that um, it doesn't, what this table does is talk about tree species, in, several tree species in particular of a certain size, but it also talks about eligibility of trees that are um, either conifers or broadleaf. It can be at least, if they're at least 20 inches in diameter, then they, they would be eligible. If a tree growing on city-owned property fell into one of these categories and was otherwise healthy, then that's the sort of thing I think we're talking about, but we'd like to get your feedback on that. Um, and as a starting point for, for this process. And diameter breast height means measuring the trunk diameter at four and a half feet above the ground. That's a standard measurement. 
As far as who is responsible for maintaining trees, um, property owners are responsible for street trees abutting the property, and that includes city-owned property. So if you have street trees abutting storm ponds and city-owned land and that kind of thing, city is a property owner, and we would f follow that public tree code for that. And then, as I just mentioned, commercial, public, and multifamily on-site trees. The Parks and Recreation Department maintains trees on city-owned parkland and in trails, and that's like the cemetery, the library, the Pioneer Center, and the trail area around the cove, as well as others. Um, Public Works Department has kind of a more confined role. Um, they principally are involved in maintaining trees within storm ponds, and there are some natural resource overlay district tracks that are city-owned that the Public Works Department um, maintains, and they're principally involved in making sure that any hazard trees are taken care of and replaced in, in that situation. Um, and then the planning department just issues permits. So we will review uh, public, uh, public land tree permits as well as uh, street tree permits, and then minor site plan design review permits as well. Can I come back to the property owners here? I yeah. Know, I know it applies. There are things like parking strips and so forth. Right. Uh, are there other examples of, of, of trees? Technically, any tree growing adjacent to a, a property, it could be in an alleyway as well, and yeah. it's a volunteer tree that's growing there, but we, we treat that as a street tree as well. Um, we have some unimproved rights of way, and those are um, a lot of times those unimproved rights of way are growing in a geologic hazard overlay zone. That's why they're not improved. You know, they they don't go all the way through because of a slope or something like that. The property owner is responsible for those. Um, so there's really a. I think that we need to do a better job of reaching out to property owners to educate them about the fact that it's not just the trees that are formally planted and the planter strips that are responsible for, but they're also responsible for the ones that are occasionally in the back if they have two frontages on an alley, for example, mm -hmm. um, or in those situations where they have streets on both sides. We call that a double frontage lot. And some of the older subdivisions, like along Myers, where they have a six-foot fence between the rear yard of the property and Myers Road, and there's a street tree there. Well, technically, the property owner is responsible for that street tree. And so those are the kinds of situations where it's important to educate um, and, and, uh, and take care of those trees as well. Yeah. Oh, wrong mouse. Yeah. And so uh, the Parks Department had some conversations with John earlier today, and um, I just wanted to throw up some of their considerations. Now, for the Parks Department, um, they maintain a lot of trees and a lot of parks, and there's, um, some of those parks are within the Natural Resource Overlay District, and then some of them aren't. Um, they're principally concerned with taking care of dead, diseased, dying, and hazardous trees, and that's where they spend a lot of their time pruning and. Um, removal and those kinds of things. There's a, obviously a very important public safety aspect to that. Um, they're very intent on keeping the canopy healthy and they love healthy trees and they love trees in general. That's why we're involved in uh, various efforts to do replanting in, in the parks and that kind of thing. Um, some additional considerations that are Dynamic are, you know, the influx of in certain types of invasive trees, uh, invasive tree species like uh, the uh, tree, of heaven. tree of heaven, that one, and there's three or four others, including the uh, what is it, the cherry laurel and uh, holly, and several other invasive trees like that. So we've written in some exemptions in the natural resource overlay district to allow. Uh, those trees to be removed without uh, type two natural resource overlay district review and that kind of thing. Um, the Parks Department um, does operate on a very tight budget and they have a very long backlog of maintenance on existing parks. So it's always a consideration of staffing and cost 
and John can probably speak to that a little bit more too. And then there's other things going on. So we have habitat, uh, beaver habitat along the cove and the beavers will chew through the cottonwoods and you know, that's something that's a, something where we have to manage the habitat at the same time that we're managing public safety. Um, and, uh, and then we have the emerald ash border borer, is which is here? moving westward slowly. It's, it's not here yet, yet. It's not here now. So <laughs> John, you were telling me a little bit about that earlier today. So there's some considerations on the horizon where yeah. we anticipate having to replace trees on a pretty large scale, right, John? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so uh, what I was telling Pete was just that um, like as new parks are being brought online or n new new trees are bring, being brought in, um, for example, the Tyrone Woods Memorial Park, um, actually we, we received the tree list and it had ash trees on it. Um, so we made sure to, to have those trees replaced with a different varietal. Um, no, the ash borer is not here, but when it does come, and it will, um, it, it's going to be pretty devastating. So anything that we can do ahead of time, possibly thinking about replacing, um, avoiding those varieties and new plantings, um, all of that I think will put us in a better place moving forward. Uh, kind of a separate question. I, 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 the one that comes into mind is you uh, is on the trail, and you've got the asphalt trail there in in, uh, in Cedar Creek Park that goes um, that goes up a, s a fairly steep slope, and I notice the tree roots are lifting that asphalt out. Uh, I, I mean, what, what what do you do when you have those problems that you can't? that you would not end up in injuring the uh, roots in the process. Yeah, I mean, we, we run into tree root situations like that quite frequently. Um, some of the times, if the tree roots are small enough, we can cut the root if it's under 30% or less. Um, some instances, it depends on the upheaval as well, on, on how great the upheaval is. So. Um, creating a trip hazard. We've ramped up asphalt so that it meets at a more even point. Um, so we try, we try to use every, every trick that we have in our toolbox to try, to try to address them, try to minimize it, try to eliminate it. Um, we're currently working on um, the Veterans War Memorial at the cemetery. Um, we hold our Memorial Day events there a lot of activity, a lot of people, and um, those large sequoias um, have a lot of surface roots. And so we just brought in an arborist um, to give us some um, um, possible solutions as we look to redesign um, the Veterans Memorial. How can we best approach the project and have as minimal of an impact as possible on those trees. So um, always always just trying to figure out best, best case scenario for everything. So my last slide is a, a set of questions for the NRC um, that we can refer back to af after we've heard the public comment, but the, they are, um, in general, is the heritage tree code as suitable as a trigger for further analysis? Or what other additional considerations should we use when we're talking about alternative methods to retain healthy trees? Um, what type of public notice are we talking about? Are we talking about signs directly on trees or on the property where the trees are? Is that the best way to notify people that there's a, a pending removal and there's a way to educate through that process and then a, a contact and point of contact, that kind of thing. What kind of information do we want to include on that notice? Um, and how do we balance that noticing with, with, with staff time and resources? Um, what alternatives should be considered to avoid removing an otherwise healthy tree or trees that present a public safety risk? And who should the decision maker be? Um, you know, there's a number of things where it kind of makes sense for the majority of the smaller trees or something that is a hazardous situation where it's clearly 
documented and there's and it can be handled through a type one review over the counter that kind of makes sense but obviously there's a threshold at which the public should be noticed notified and the, de the decision maker goes to a higher higher level uh, whether that's the city manager with possibility for uh, discussion or appeal to a higher body you know that's the kind of thing we're talking about and none of this is set in policy or code just yet so um, and there may be some additional questions and comments that you have in addition to these. Yes, Doug. One thing that I had mentioned before, when a developer came in to, uh, I presume it's the Westing, Westling Farms area, and uh, there was this one great, beautiful uh, white oak that's uh, there, and they actually diverted the sidewalk to give it plenty of space. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, but I don't think any of our our development codes required. I assume maybe the developer did it volunteered on, on their own. Mm -hmm. And I, my question is, where we find trees that meet these, uh, and I'm just saying the heritage trees, but maybe the more general aspect, if we decide that this is a good basis of of, of designating the trees in general, whether development codes, when you see those kinds of trees in the development, whether in fact the developer can be uh, uh, constrained in that sense of actually right. doing something like that. Right, so fleshing out the tree protection code to actually require it as opposed to just encouraging it. I think that's kind of what you're talking about. Yeah. And then combining that with a combination of alternative public works standards and that sort of thing. Yeah, I think that's exactly what we're talking about. You're talking about the same chapter of code, chapter 1741. Um, and um, um, that is, that's a little broader discussion that we were intending to have with you tonight, um, but because um, we were principally talking about city owned land. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I, um, I would, I could see that in the, on the horizon. I'm, I'm, yeah. I mean, that would be future city on land. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, that's right. If there's an easement for a sidewalk, it's going to encompass that area, so it's going to become part of it, or it's a dedicated, dedicated right of way. Um, I think, I think some of those are in actual easements. So it's uh, it's either an access for sidewalk, and it's also an easement for tree protection potentially. That kind of thing. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, okay. We've got two comments for public or public comments tonight. Uh, one from Dorothy Dalsrud and one from Denise McGriff. Um, I'll let Dorothy go first. Is her here first? <laughs> Look like a lumberjack today, don't I? <laughs> the along. Hi, my name is Dorothy Dalsred. Um, I just wanted to put my input in, and and I'm glad you brought up the, the the subject about curving sidewalks and curving trees. I'm or curving sidewalks and curving roads. I'm currently collecting every single picture I can find in cities, and a lot of cities are curving and and using them as ways to actually slow down traffic in neighborhoods because the sidewalks are now curving out and protecting the trees. And they're also curving into people's properties where the, the sidewalks will curve into a piece of property to save the tree. Um, and, I'm, and I'm noticing this in Canby, Molala, Oakland, California. I found five, five examples walking down the street. So I'm just trying to encourage that we do build around our trees as much as possible. You can build dang right up next to an oak and it won't hurt the oak if you're just a little bit careful in that is very um, important. Um, as far as our city trees, I'm very, very concerned about just, I'll just stick with oaks for right now, just because I have to stay within my three minutes. <laughs> On Lynn Avenue, there were seven oaks, now there's five. The five oaks that are adjacent onto that property right now to a, a lovely church, but they really find those streets to be a burden. 
they could give a hill of beans if they give down. There's a lovely, lovely oaks. How do we protect the trees that are city-owned trees that the adjacent neighbors really don't even care? They find them to be a nuisance because they feel that they're already a burden and they're not really. They're just there. <laughs> and they do have to be pretend that, you know, take care of them. But how do we protect those trees if we have someone to sign off for them? That's something I think that you ought to consider. Um, the city saying, yeah, we're going to protect them anyway, whether the adjacent property owner is not because we own those trees or we're stewards. We don't own them. They were here way before us and they'll be here way after us because they can live a thousand years. Um, and I also really like the one suggestion that um, Dan Holiday said, why don't we at least start with a 50 year old tree? You can, you can look at, and especially a native, you can look and measure a tree very quickly and, to, and age a tree. And if it's somewhere around 50 years or older, well, I'll have to stop and contemplate that one. I thought that was just a very good basis suggestion. And I'll stand behind that one and give it a round of applause. Thank you very much. I guess the question I would have is yeah. that often to actually age the tree is sometimes problematic. You don't want to take a core of it. So forth. But that the di what's the problem with actually using the diameter as that, an indicator? That is how you, that's how you do it. And, and you can actually have an application on your phone that you just go over, measure the diameter, click on a down drop of the type of tree, click <coughs> on the diameter in either um, centimeters and or inches and in either a circumference and or a diameter. Um, and it will automatically age the tree for you within 10%. Um, or you can do the old version and measure it and divide it by pi and then times it by the growth rate, which those lists are all over the internet too. I can give you 15 growth rates right now. We can put those growth rates on our own websites if we wish to. We can put a link to that. Um, do it yourself, download your app on our websites. I'd encourage us to make our heritage that's wrong subject, I will, I will stop there. But anyway, that is something that we could very easily do is to age a tree. I encourage getting our Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts out there just doing it. When people know the age of a tree, it's mind boggling. Because you think a tree's 100 years old and it'll turn out to be 300. You think a tree's 150 years old and you go, wow, that tree's only 65 years old? Wow, you can get that beautiful tree in 65 years? I need to plant 65 more. Anyway, um, those are some things I really encourage that are simple little things that'll just make you stop, think, digest the thought, how can we save this? And if we don't have the money to save it, who do we look to? Look to your neighborhood associations. A lot of times, if you put it out and you're t someone will sponsor a tree, they might want to put their name on it. But, or even or an organization's name on it but it would at least give one more link to say, yeah, that person might want to give that a, a, a doctrine. There's a, a, there's an incredible 300 plus tree old tree in Park Place Park that needs some doctoring and it, and it should not die. Well, thank you. Thank you for your time. Our next public comment comes from Denise McGriff. Welcome. Good evening. I was just here last night. Uh, I'm Denise McGriff, and I'm, you know that I live in Oregon City. Um, I just have a few comments for you with regard to this. Obviously, you're very aware that uh, I know way too much about this particular issue. Uh, I'm not here tonight to uh, throw anybody under the bus. And as you're aware, the commission had a robust discussion about this. And the question was how um, we needed to deal with it. I think uh, if possible, it might be, and I don't always recommend this, behoove you to look at the city commission meeting where this discussion occurred because there are a number of suggestions. Number one, we talked about uh, this applying to all publicly owned properties, not just city property. And that was one of the things that we did talk about. We um, talked about using the heritage tree code as possibly a minimum. Uh, we also talked a lot about um, applying some uh, incentives and maybe some disincentives. I know that's not part of your bailiwick, but I'm just throwing it out there. So uh, 
what I want to talk about is, is in terms of comments, and um, I come back with my private hat on and talk about some of those items there. But I think as Oregon City has been designated as a Tree City USA, we should be holding ourselves to a much higher standard, regardless of whether we were a Tree City, but that, that means something to me. That means that we have standards, that we have policies, that we have things in our codes, and our city decision making regarding trees should be with regard to how do we save trees? How do we preserve trees? How do we incentivize making sure that our community knows that we do value trees? And what I mean by that is that um, in the last probably five years, the neighborhood that I live in has been subject to a lot of what I call uh, weekend chainsaw activity. And it's very discouraging to drive down a street where you know there was a tree and somebody has taken it upon themselves to remove it. And there's not a lot Pete or Jonathan can do after the fact. Uh, it's just depressing that, that that has continued to happen and I know it happens in other neighborhoods. So I think one of the things that would be, would be um, helpful is that well, we referred this to you, and I'm not here speaking on behalf of the City Commission, I'm just telling you generally what I heard at the meeting and the notes that I took, that we referred, the City Commission referred this back to you all for your review. And I'm hoping that you can move this through the process as quickly as you possibly can so that we can have something in place in the very near future. I don't know what that is, but just as soon as you possibly can, because it is a critical issue. I know. I got a comment from somebody that said we should be more concerned about X, Y, or Z than two trees that were taken down at the pool. Well, I can tell you when your phone starts blowing up over the weekend <laughs> and people are coming to your house to talk to you about stuff, um, your attention does get a little bit diverted on some issues. So I, I think just all in all that I you know, appreciate the, um, the work that's been done by staff to date and uh, that we're gonna move forward on this. And I think in summary, that we as a city should err on the side of extreme caution. You know, if it looks like a duck, quacks like a duck, and it probably is a duck, probably should delay any adverse decision. Now, I will tell you that yesterday we are, I was aware, made aware, not yesterday, but two weeks ago, that there may be some tree removal at the library. So I know that the city, it's because we've got two elms that have Dutch elm disease that are about ready to bite the dust. Uh, one of the things is unfortunately one of them has been infested with some sort of beetle and we won't be able to save it. But I think the other thing that came out of this is that if we do have to remove a tree and it's the wood's okay, that the wood is going to be reclaimed by the city because we all own that wood. We all own those trees. So we should be able to get some use out of it. And, we, and it was mentioned by one of the commissioners that, gee, we've got a public works department that's gonna need some stuff. We've got a police department. It wouldn't be great to utilize that like we did at the library with, with some of the pro things there. So I'm, I'm just saying that we should continue to err on the side of caution. And if we think that it might cause some sort of kerfuffle, let's try to avoid having a kerfuffle because I think when people are involved and they're knowledgeable about what's going on, there's less, less problems. But I did want to mention that if you happen to go down Rylance Lane, if you all know where that is, there is the uh, historic William L. Holmes house. And some years ago, there's a gigantic oak. And although I did not enjoy raking up all those acorns two weeks ago, there are probably more now, uh, they were able to save the tree. It was causing problems with the sidewalk. And they were able to go around with some pervious, impervious pavers. And it's, you know, it's perfectly walkable, and it's an, it's an example that's been there for probably five to 10 years of where there was a major tree, and the city looked at it and said, yeah, you can, you can do this. The, the, the property owners did not want to take the tree out. Uh, they wanted to preserve it because it does provide some great shade, but it goes around, and you can still, and it goes into that property, but that's okay, because they agreed to that. So there are many examples of how we can look at alternative uh, methods for making sure we have public sidewalk wide enough for anybody that needs to use, including ADA accessibility and that sort of thing. So we've, we've done it. We, we can continue to do it. And again, like I said, let's just err on the side of caution. It's just, you know, 
I think this community is very, very concerned about trees. And I think that's been evident over the last few years uh, with some tree removals that have occurred, not on public property, but on private property as well. So it's just kind of, and I know that uh, a certain commissioner said that they did not want to implement a tree ordinance that applies to private property, but I think someday we will get there. So for now, we're look, just looking at public property and that would include our friends at the county, maybe our friends at a water district. We don't know, but it's gonna, we'd like it to apply across the board to not just the city. The city's gonna set the standard and the example. And so hopefully the other jurisdictions, when something goes on, they will look to us and say, oh, well, this is probably what Oregon City would like to have us do and they will contact us. So that's all I have to add, unless you have some questions for me. And I'll just continue. I just to... want to say one thing for you and Dee Dee. Uh, Ten years ago, I replaced the sidewalk by my house that was falling apart, and I had a maple tree. And the city, that when the sidewalk guy came out, he actually suggested that we cut, make a curve in the sidewalk to, and that the tree was little then. And yeah. It's like now I'm really glad I did that because yeah. that tree's getting and bigger. And it's got room so. to grow there. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Well, that's great. So I want I want to just say that the city does do that yes. on a regular basis. And I have a friend that have a huge oak and the city curved the sidewalk when they put the sidewalk in, so. Well, yeah, see, that's just great. That's yeah. super. Thank you so much. And right. uh, we'll look forward to seeing your work. And I'll probably be back. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks. So it sounds as if um, the discussion at the city commission level was a little broader in terms of not just city owned land, publicly owned land. Um, and that, um, and I, I think it, um, we're gonna need to come back to you with some, some markups, so some re initial concepts for code um, and probably red lines. Um, and, but before we do that, I just wanted to get your initial input. Um, and we're, we may be back before you in December. Um, I'm not sure how soon and we'll, we'll actually have that because there's a lot, a lot going on. I'd be willing on, to but, help. Yeah, that would be great. Too, so. So, thank you, yeah. Uh, it's been a real help having you look at the Heritage Tree Code. Um, you as you all, need all help of you. me rewrite that. And you too, thank you, yes. <laughs> 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 um, and, any other questions or comments for me? I uh, guess, you know, and we're gonna be focusing on those that are publicly owned facilities and so forth. Uh, the notion that it could apply to other government entities, I think would be a good idea, but I'd be very reticent, uh, at least at this time, to talk about what private property owners do their, to their land. I know I was extremely disappointed when the historic Huntley House, they cut down this beautiful Douglas fir that was there. And, Which house? Uh, Huntley House is on, oh, you know, yeah. on Washington Street. Yeah. But you know, that's why it's so important to educate the people about the Heritage Tree uh, Code. When people buy a house and it has that designation, they recognize that they'll be inheriting the responsibility for that particular tree. And, uh, but for, for trees that are on existing own properties, I'd, I'd be kind of reticent to to tell them, oh, you, you, what you have to do with I, your. I, I totally agree with you, Doug. I, I think, I mean, it's one thing to have a heritage tree code and 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 have it managed on publicly owned property and stuff like that. Um, but I, I do, I, I have a lot of, a lot of concern about dictating or, or or coming up with code or rules that would say what public or a privately owned ground could could or couldn't do with their ground. So I think right now it'd be a good thing to kind of push this forward and say, let's get this program up and running because mm. I think how many heritage trees even before the code rewrite do we actually have in Oregon City? Well, four through four. that program. So yeah. I think, I think uh, before we could really go down that road, I think we would need to really show how the program has worked and publicly owned ground before we could even go down that road. Mm -hmm. And I do have a question, you know, sure. and, I, and I thought about it when we were looking at the Heritage Tree Code and when I saw these, but um, maybe you could shed some light why we made the uh, recommendation that we have, other than the specifically identified trees, higher diameters on other broadleaf species and other conifer tree species, and the ones that we identify, they're lower diameters. Uh, was there a logic behind that? I don't. It was mostly we wanted to, we wanted to mostly protect native species, and yeah. some of the native species, like 
Pacific dogwoods, a five inch Pacific dogwood is pretty old, mm -hmm. really, because it mm -hmm. takes them a long time to get there. But other tree species, we wanted to protect non-native trees because there are a lot of ornamental trees that are also worth protecting and I you know some of those are fantastic specimens but we set it higher because they're not native yeah. so that was what the 20 inch thing and I, I mean I've got a sequoia behind my house that's probably going to fall on my house but um, it's planted next to the parking strip it, the, it's literally yeah, it, it's horrible um, but it, I remember when it was planted it's only been in I think it's been in under 30 years and it's <laughs> wow <laughs> they grow I mean they're really weeds sequoia. so mm -hmm. we wanted to at least put 20 a 20 foot sequoia is like about yeah. 10 we're, years old we're, we're, I'm wondering <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm wondering I'm not talking about changing the heritage tree thing right, but, right. I'm, but I'm, for I'm, this, I'm thinking about uh, on what we're talking about, trees on public land, whether we would have a, might want to have a diameter that's more in, in tune with the native species diameters that we've established here, and not apply necessarily to the heritage tree code. Uh, but uh, uh, I don't. I don't understand what, do you want to make them bigger or smaller? Smaller, for, okay. the, for the roads, I mean, for the, for the public, um, we could get Dee Dee to get her program out and tell us what size <laughs> white oak is, yeah. you know, 30 years old, yeah. which is going to be small. Oaks are take yeah, forever yeah. to grow. Yeah. Mm. And depending on where they're growing. Yeah, that's the other thing. I mean, the, yeah. the apps are valuable yeah, for a general it's, thing. It's, yeah, very, very yeah. generalized, so it's, but that's, it's not yeah. specific at all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's really a so that'd be not the good only, way to age trees. I mean, I think we got a standard there on the Heritage Tree Code. It makes sense for us to look at that as the basis. But I was wondering on the, uh, for the purpose of the publicly owned land, whether we'd want to reduce the diameter on the other species. That's a, that's a question. Oh, I see. So other broadleaf or something. You know, I think the, I think, I think it's more important to protect the native species, I, I agree. like the oaks and stuff. Right. But on but public lands, I think we should protect any mature tree that we have. Because yeah. if, if we cut it down and replace it, it's going to take some time for that replacement to, yeah. to, to create that shaded canopy and so forth on the streets. It's just a thought. Right. Okay. You know, I know what you're saying. That, then that would be something yeah, I, to consider. I think that one's going to kind of, I mean, yeah. kind of come down to... Mm -hmm. I, could, I, I guess I was thinking more like if, if they're planting new stuff, depending on what the species and stuff like that comes down to. I just, na native is always going to take the king, king and my mm, foot on it. Okay. Well, I can see potentially some form of this table or an amended table in Chapter 1741 with similar diameter thresholds. Um, and it'll say either city owned or publicly owned pr right. land as a, as a subsection heading. And it deals specifically with that process. Um, without, I mean, we might want to take the redwoods and leave them at 20 and make other conifers something smaller because those grow so fast, fast that, yeah. you know, and yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so. And I don't know if they're looking at the code, because no, I was we, reading the, the the attachments that you know you sent on right. the agenda and about replacing the trees. It's the general replacement thing. So you're planting, you know, they took down this huge oak and they're replanting a couple of little right. tiny things. And mm -hmm. I know you can't put another huge oak in there because mm -hmm. you can't transplant them that well. But it seems like. Maybe we should be, if they're taking a, a big tree like this out on public property, that they mm -hmm. need to replant it with at least a bigger tree than what we're demanding the developers do. Okay. Yeah, because right now, regardless of the diameter, if, if you have, right now it works like you have an arborist report, says it's dead, disease, dying, or hazardous. It's removed from the mitigation calculation entirely. Okay. And there's no third party review of that arborist report going on. Okay. Uh, other than, you know, so it's the developer's arborist and it goes right. into the record right. kind of that way. So potentially you have a higher 
third party review threshold, a notification process for city owned land situation. Right. right. And, and different replacement. And different replacement. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, because yeah. yeah. It you know, it could be completely hollow, but it's you completely know. hollow trees are very healthy a lot of exactly. the time. Exactly. <laughs> um, so. I'm a college. I'm a forest ecologist. <laughs> yeah, I know. No, that's Jet what trees saying. are good trees. I don't know. As long as, and then there, there's going to be a discussion about is it a hazard and what right. what is the right. hazard? Is, is there a target? And this is what John deals with all the time. Right. Is, you know, that, what is that public hazard and is there a way for the public to be notified and see all of the various parameters are being considered right. prior to the decision being made. And maybe, you know, in some cases, could you do something to mitigate something? I don't know whether that right. is there a could decision? have been saved, but the walnut was, and considering we're losing black walnuts mm -hmm. at an alarming rate because of that blight. Yeah. Because I've got one in my yard and it's still good, huh? 10,000 canker. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I had to cut one out. I had two in my yard and I had to cut one down and the other one's still healthy, thank goodness. But mm -hmm. I mean, on the way I drive to work, I just watched 10 of them along Charbonneau Road get cut down like a couple last year. And then this year, the other one started dying and there's like two left. And it used to be this huge row of like Barlow House. Mm -hmm. That's just so sad. All right. All right. So to cut down a black walnut that's healthy to me is just like, oh, because <laughs> yeah. Any other? Comments, questions? Okay. Um, we will go away and do some work and come back and show you what we've got. Yeah, get a hold of me and I, I'm willing to sit down, help, or run it by me and I'll get back to you faster or something. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the comments. All right, anybody else have anything else on that subject? All right, communications. Okay, do you want to begin with member reports and then I'll chime in afterwards? Sure. Doug, you got anything? Well, today I attended the Environmental Learning Center had a um, presentation in terms of the actual development of the Environmental Center and what they did. I was extremely impressed. The number of agencies that turned out to have them participate in those discussions and their experiences with uh, uh, working in, in watersheds and so forth. Uh, uh, several government entities were there. A few watershed councils were represented. It was a great turnout. And they had a great deal of discussion. Uh, it, and they talked about the problems they had in terms of the, of the restoration work that they've done and so forth. The one thing that I think came out from everybody that's involved was Water Environmental Services was there and as uh, Oregon City Public Works and various other organizations is they when do when they do restoration work, they seek uh, grant money to come in and do restoration work and so forth. Maintenance is a huge thing, particular um, invasive maintenance and so forth, and suggesting that you need to build in 15% of your money in there for longer term maintenance, oh. or or you're going to do uh, you're, you're going to end up with yeah, almost the same fine. thing you're, yeah. you're, that you faced uh, to begin with. So uh, I think any group and and if we seek funds too to do any restoration work. Uh, we need to have that uh, long-term maintenance piece as part of the budgetary process. Yeah. That was, that was something that came out from almost everybody that was there in terms of their experience. Well, it's an important point. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have anything in, in communicado. Uh, yeah, nothing for me. Nothing for me either. Okay, I'm looking. All right, so we have, uh, if I can open this, Friends of Trees planting okay. event um, coming up, and it's going to be in many more neighborhoods this year. Um, you can sign up, so let's see, it's going to be, oh boy, am I having technical difficulties? Uh, the uh, date is going to be 
on the uh, November 23rd is the date. And I believe sorry, I've got two conflicting emails from Oh, here it is. All right. So far they have uh, 50, 50 trees that they're planting. They're shooting for 100. Um, they do still need help recruiting volunteers. Um, and they're inviting the community to join in this tree planting event Saturday, November 23rd. Sign up through the Friends of Trees website, which is www.friendsoftrees.org slash OC. And they want folks to arrive at 845. I'm trying to find the location. At, is it at the Lutheran Church? Yeah. Zion? Yeah. Thank you. Zion Lutheran Church, so it's been staged out of there before. Thanks to them. Is it, it's great. Is it, too, is it too late to sign up? Oh, I would presume that. I don't, I don't believe so, no. You can, you can, uh, um, they'll be serving breakfast well, I didn't know they up for trees to be planted, is what I meant to say. I don't believe so. I think you can still sign up. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, there'll be a potluck lunch for all volunteers after the planting is complete. And then this year they are, right now the signups, there are 14 signups in Barclay Hills, three in Gaffney Lane, no one in Hazel Grove, Westland Farm. Hillendale has one. <laughs> McLaughlin is 37. Whoop. <laughs> Rivercrest, 11. South End, 15. And Tower Vista, 11. So that's a big expansion. Yeah. Do they indicate what trees they have available, what species? Yeah, they do. Okay. Um, and I believe they will also plant them in your yard, front yard, if you don't have a planter strip. Um, so, and uh, um, they're fairly cheap. I think they're, last year they were going at $35 a tree. And so that's, that's a nice, and they're good trees. They're really quality, so. Plus, Friends of Trees, because this is what they offer the city that we can't do on our own is education, outreach, pruning, uh, watering advice on the first two years, and then uh, they'll check it over that period. Okay. Yeah. So that's going on. Thanks. Did you have anything? All right. That's all I have. So future agenda items. Potentially be. So, well. yeah. So Jerry, Jerry yeah. couldn't make it, but uh, he did communicate with me um, about inviting Audubon, uh, Mary Coolidge is her name, staff person, and she's involved with uh, education and program about um, how to minimize impacts of uh, lighting, in particular LED lighting on bird habitat, as well as uh, uh, how to design buildings to minimize bird uh, impacts on windows and that kind of thing. So I spoke to her, they're doing it, but they couldn't make it to this meeting, uh, but they would be interested in coming in the next meeting to talk about that. Um, and uh, very busy program up in Portland right now. Um, um, and so I think there's some pretty cost effective ways that folks can, um, minimize the use of LEDs in the exterior of their house, but I didn't know what what the science behind it was, and she does. Mm -hmm. So um, um, that's one of the issues. Um, and then anything else that we have coming before you, with, that which would include what we just talked about tonight. Um, and uh, what else is going on? Um, yeah, we'll probably be getting back to you with the status of our comprehensive plan grant application and whether we, and um, that's, we've got, uh, we're gonna be submitting that grant through the Department of Transportation. They're helping us with the scope 
Um, we hope to be able to dovetail the two grant sources from the Department of Land Conservation and Development and the ODOT Transportation and Growth Management, two separate grant sources, hopefully combine them into one pot of money with one dovetailed scope so that we can manage the project fairly efficiently um, and then embark on a pretty uh, rigorous and groundbreaking public involvement process unlike anything we've ever really done before because we really wanna focus on uh, reaching out to community members who typically aren't involved um, or don't have the time to be involved. Um, so we're hoping to partner with a uh, community-based organization that has ties to the community already, the uh, communities of color and low-income communities, subsidized housing communities, and those kinds of things that have inroads into the community already and can speak to them with us. Um, and that's gonna be taking up a lot of Christina and my time for the next two years. So, <laughs> right. on top of the other stuff. Um, so I'll update on that, and we'll put what time we'll well, we may be getting back to you on the uh, Willamette River Greenway yep. and uh, Beaver Creek Road as well. Okay. Updates yeah. on the Cove. Cove, I haven't heard anything okay. right now. Um, there's some property transactions going on that we're not privy to, so. Yeah. Yeah. So as far as uh, we have the one applicant today, Christopher Weaver. Um, yeah. Do we have any more? Or that's it for now. It? Yeah. Okay. So um, we waiting. Do we should we wait to make? No, you can make a. Dis you can discuss it and. Because this will be for starting next year's term. I'm assuming. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, uh, I believe Matt and Jerry are stepping down. Okay. Boo hoo! Sad to see you go. That's. But thank you. Mm -hmm. Will you be here for the December meeting? I'll be here for the December meeting. Okay. Do you want to take action then? I mean, I guess we've got quorum today, so I mean, we've got an applicant, we might as well. Uh, I, I, unless, you, unless anybody has any qualms, that's my no, suggestion. I was so. impressed by, by his uh, experience and yeah, so forth. I think uh, he seems, yeah, so. I, I move to recommend to the mayor the appointment of. Uh, I'll second that. Okay, <laughs> great. We have consensus. Uh, yes. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Aye. Thank yeah. you. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Excellent. Um, I'll uh, but we we found out we're supposed to actually take vote? roll call. Take a roll, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. We can do that. Okay. So we have a motion from Doug and a second from Trent to uh, recommend to the mayor the appointment of Chris Weaver to the Natural Resources Committee. And Doug, what's your vote? Aye. Trent. Aye. Matt? Aye. Nancy? Aye. Thank you. Yep. Great. All right. And I guess we'll adjourn the meeting for November 13th. Great. Thank you.